All right. Hi, everyone. This is attorney Liz Barletta from the Barletta team at Ligris, and I am here with superstars Mike Urban from EXP and Lacey Feria from Cross Country. How are you guys? Awesome. How are you? Good. I'm super excited to just chat with you guys because um, obvious rock stars, and I just maybe if you want to give a couple, uh, like a minute about sort of how you got to where you are, Mike, and um, then we can do the same for Lacey. Sure. Um, I'll be as brief as I can. I started in the business pretty much right out of high school uh, as a licensed electrician. I did that for 10 years. Uh, then I had a couple life events that happened and I wanted to change the trajectory of my career. I uh, got into real estate sales about eight years ago. And um, over the last eight years, we've accumulated uh, over 90 agents now across multiple states. And that's pretty much it. I moved to Boston. I'm originally from um, Pennsylvania and still have a real estate business there as well. But um, yeah, it, it, that that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Love that. Lacey, how about you? What, your trajectory to get to where you are today at Cross Country? Yeah. Absolutely. I started my real estate career as a real estate paralegal about 14, 15 years ago. I did real estate sales part time. And then realize that I know so much about the mortgage side. I'm a numbers girl and problem solver. So I got into mortgages in 2018 and um, built my business pretty quickly and it took off from there. I love that. That's awesome. I, I, I'm I similarly, you know, from uh, out of state, going to Boston, growing a business. And it's, it's cool to be able to, you know, grow from sort of nothing it, when you're kind of a transplant. So that's super impressive, Mike, that you have that many sort of agents that you're working with. Um, so I, I obviously you have people who follow you from different states, but um, in Massachusetts particularly, because that's sort of where we're working, um, how is the process? How's like competition these days? Like what's the market looking like in your eyes? Um, in terms of competition, you mean for, for buyers? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so it's still competitive in a lot of the markets surrounding Boston. A lot of the suburbs are super competitive still. And I think what that translates to is our inventory, right? We've had low inventory for the last few years. Geez, we had low inventory pre-COVID, right? Uh, and, and it's a problem. It only got it only got more difficult uh, during the stages of COVID. And then also, because there were so many buyers, because rates were so low, we got inventory taken off of the market no new inventory has been coming on the market. Now rates are high and people are hesitant to sell their homes. So what happens is that just creates a this, this problem of more buyers than there are homes and people are still getting into bidding wars, although not quite as much as it was during the peak of the pandemic. But uh, that's because a lot of, obviously, you know, a lot of buyers got knocked out of the market, but certain markets, certain price brackets, are less competitive, right? Um, certain markets, certain price brackets are more competitive. And, and a lot of that has to deal with school district too. Um, yeah. You know, good school districts just promote uh, more families and, and and stuff moving there. And uh, yeah, it's, that, those are the toughest markets to get into in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's totally fair because I remember even, um, you know, how Boston is always just super competitive it has been for a long long time but then the shift with the with pandemic the suburbs became like a super hot commodity like everybody was leaving the city to the you know to the suburbs so i feel like that really highlighted the fact that there was not just going to be bidding words in boston anymore which i feel like there were you know for for many years um but then it like kind of grew outside of the city too yeah yeah it's uh I mean, the pandemic changed the trajectory of a lot of, you know, suburbs around multiple cities across the country. We, we're seeing this across multiple areas. Now, there are some areas outside of Massachusetts that received hyper uh, inflated prices and they're starting to cool off. But for the most part here, you know, we're still seeing the same things we saw a year ago. And, and again, I think that has a lot to do with the rates. Yeah, no, for sure. And Lacey, you want to speak to that? Like how... How are rates, I mean, obviously rates are what they are, but like how has that impacted your conversations with your agents or yeah, with your agents and your buyers? Um, we'll start with buyers. I think it's 
key to educate and motivate. Educate and motivate are my two key words um, the last two years. I feel like I have been nurturing my clients a lot more, teaching them about um, what a future refinance would look like to get out of this high rate environment. For me, <clears throat> we go over monthly payment quite like the most when I'm reviewing a pre-approval and I make sure that my clients are okay with that monthly payment for a short, short amount of time. Um, and then we price the refinance in the future. So I go over different price points if it drops by half of a point or if it drops by a full point, kind of give them a light at the end of the tunnel. And I feel like that really motivates my clients and keeps them in the market. Yeah. Um, with my agents, it's a team effort type of thing. Um, I work with a lot of higher producers like Mike. Um, I know he motivates his clients very well. So between the two of us, we are making sure that we're keeping our buyers in the market, that they're not scared to purchase. I give my own personal advice about how I've bought properties. I bought one last year with a high interest rate, but um, telling them those stories is, is really helpful and they feel really comfortable with me and they trust me and they um, usually end up buying a house in a short amount of time when they're pre-approved with me. Uh, and talking about a short time, so like, Mike, do you want to speak to like the, the length of time for a home buying process in Massachusetts? Because I feel like more and more it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So the, 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 if somebody is in, it, it depends, right? So I think the process from contract to closing uh, could potentially be shorter, meaning, you know, you write an offer, let's say, hypothetically, it gets accepted. Uh, a lot of buyers, and it depends on the time of year too, but a lot of buyers want to close as soon as humanly possible because yeah. a lot of them are renting. They want to get out of their lease. They gave their notice. Uh, and, um, you know, or alternatively, it took them a long time to get an offer accepted. They already gave their notice and now they want to speed up the process. So, I mean, generally, and Lacey could speak on this too, and obviously, you know, but I mean, we see anywhere from 30 to 45 days, somewhere in the middle there. Um, although we've been seeing a lot of hard money and ca <clears throat> cash buyers want to close, you know, within 30 days, that, that happens as well, um, as you guys know too. But uh, for the most part, generally, you're, you know, pre-approved conventional buyer, you're looking at anywhere, I would say like 35 to 37 days would be a safe bet. Yeah. Um, as long as the, if the house is vacant, it obviously could be shorter. If the house is occupied, then it can be a little bit longer than that, as you know, but that's, yeah. that's pretty much a generalization. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing too. Cause it's, you know, even in terms of the market being competitive as it is, uh, like anything that can kind of like give you a little edge to the other buyer who's also submitting an offer is huge. And that kind of speaks to like the um, working with Lacey and, and talking to Lacey about like, okay, you know, how long is underwriting going to be work like now? Like you have to kind of know what's going on at that moment in time, because like in the middle of April, <laughs> it's going to be different than February underwriting processing times and things like that. So like having that open right. is, is huge. I think that a lot of, of, of what happened during the pandemic, and, and Lacey could speak on this too, is uh, the getting pre-underwritten um, massively speeds up the process. And, you know, when we're talking about the time to, to close, uh, time to, to get an offer accepted is a completely different thing. I have people that have been a year out, right, from getting pre-approved to actually closing on a home just because they're in hyper-competitive areas. But uh, people home buyers that are pre-approved conventional, you know, if they're working with a, a, a lender like Lacey from Cross Country Mortgage, what happens is she will pre-underwrite a lot of these people and they'll already be like multiple steps ahead of other home buyers. And uh, what happens is that speeds up the process from the time of an executed or fully executed offer to the time of closing. Uh, and, and I think a pre-underwrite is a huge deal. And that's really one component to getting an offer accepted as well. You took the right words right out of my mouth. So yeah. I'm trying to pre-underwrite everybody. Everybody that comes my way, I'm basically begging them at this point to get pre-underwritten for a couple of reasons. Um, yes, it is competitive. A lot of my closings are happening within three weeks or less. I got one clear to close in nine days re recently. Um, and it's helping them get their offers accepted. It's helping them stay ahead of the game so they're not super stressed out if we have to have a short timeline because the last thing that I want to do is to rush my client. I want to make this a happy process. If we don't have to rush, fabulous. You're not pre-underwritten and you need a quick close, 
not the end of the world. I can do it, but everyone's being rushed and everybody's super stressed. Yeah. So again, team effort here. Um, clients can get, I would say the perfect word is lazy. Sometimes they don't want to get pre underwritten, give me the extra paperwork. So if I have, a an agent backing me up, influencing them, influencing them to get pre underwritten, it helps so much. Plus it's free of charge for them. So it's kind of like a no brainer. And maybe just going super basic, like for those who don't even know what underwriting means, like what is the underwriting process like? Absolutely. So there are a couple of different types of pre-qualifications or pre-approvals. There's a pre-qualification where you give me your information, I look at it and I send you a pre-qual letter. I don't do that. Um, I do pre-approvals, which you have to send me all of your income documentation, your assets, everything. I verify every little detail and then I issue you my pre-approval. A pre-underwrite is a step above that where we pretend you have an accepted offer on a property. We send your file into the underwriter because the underwriter's job is to pick apart your file. They're the ones who give the final approval. And we're doing this all ahead of time. So they're verifying your income, your assets, and your credit. So all we will need after that are the property details, appraisal, maybe a condo approval if it's a condo, and title work from the attorney. And it's all signed off on. I can't stress how important, um, you know, working with a lender like Lacey is, if you do the pre-underwriting or not, but just having someone who's actually looking at documentation and not just saying, okay, I have something, here's a, you know, here's a pre-qualification letter. Um, it's so important. I've had, unfortunately, um, you know, transactions where, you know, buyers came with their loan officer already, and maybe it was at a big bank, someone who's really not an expert, um, you know, that's just one of the hats they wear. And um, unfortunately got to like a couple of weeks before closing, which tends to be the mortgage approval deadline. And they didn't qualify for something that I know would have been like discovered at that stage with someone like you. So it's, it's um, I, I feel like when you say like the, the teamwork of also having the people that the buyer is working with encourage that process is huge Absolutely. because that's exactly what I tell all clients. Like, you don't want to be in a situation where you fell in love with this home. You're like envisioning your, you know, Thanksgiving there. And then a week before you find out for something that literally could have been discovered back at the beginning, you wouldn't have qualified. You know, it's just, it's a heartbreaking experience for people. Yeah. It's devastating. We don't let deals fall apart here. No, no, absolutely. I love that. Um, so I think obviously pre underwriting is one tactic or strategy, but Mike, can you talk to, to us about some other strategies you're kind of employing to get buyers um, offers approved these days. What are you seeing as sort of working? Sure. It's a, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a plethora of different, it's a plethora of different things, right? Um, one thing that I've been doing and encouraging, especially for first time home buyers, if the seller and if the listing agent will allow it is to conduct a pre-offer inspection. And basically what that is, is where we walk through the property, the license inspector, you don't pay them the full amount per se, because usually they're not providing a full detailed report, but you're at least going through the property prior to writing that offer. You're getting an inspector's eyes on it. You're getting my eyes on it. And you're taking a look at what may be right or wrong with this condo, single family home, multifamily, whatever you're looking at. That way, when it comes time to write an offer, one of the <clears throat> one of the items you could potentially waive would be your inspection contingency because you've already just walked the property with an inspector. Or alternatively, if there are some major problems, uh, it, it in turn will make you not write an offer. OK, and then you won't get tied up into that property. And that's one thing that I want to stress and, and something that you were talking about before is is uh, how important it is to narrow down what you could afford. Um, and not only that, uh, avoiding things in situations where you get tied up uh, with with an agent, a lender, a property, whatever. And it just it, ta it takes so much time away from potentially buying a property that you could afford and that you could close on, especially in a low inventory market. Um, so anyway, sorry, I, I had a little segue there, but sure. uh, the pre-offer pre-offer inspection is is a really big deal. Um, piggybacking on that is obviously working with a, a lender that the listing agent either has worked with before, maybe not necessarily the person itself, but the company uh, is a huge deal. If you have some company or you know some some big internet. Um, company and you're writing uh, offers with them, it's going to be really, really difficult 
to get your offer accepted. Maybe the beginning process of getting pre-approved might be easier, perhaps, but because maybe you don't have to talk to anybody, you just click a few buttons and they they pump out this pre-approval. But uh, your your offers are just not going to get accepted because us list agents that list a lot of properties. One of the things that happens is it could come down to the finest detail on an offer. Who is the lender? Who is the agent? How much escrow are you putting down initially? How much escrow are you putting down after purchase and sale? Are there inspections? Is there a mortgage contingency? Is there an appraisal contingency? Um, so all of those things are, are really important. Another thing beside that is uh, escalation clauses. Uh, and I know those are you know double-edged swords, and it really depends on if the listing agent or seller are potentially accepting escalation clauses, but you could basically beat any offer up to a certain amount by a certain amount. And what it can do is it could it could work two ways, right? If you have a property that's been sitting on the market for 30 days, 40 days, or whatever, you go to write an offer, and all of a sudden you hear, oh, there's another offer on the table. You don't have to write an escalation clause starting at the list price. You could actually start below the list price and escalate up to the list price or even escalate uh, up to below the list price if you think somebody is like bluffing. God forbid that they do something like that. But um, escalation clause are another way to potentially – uh, get your offer accepted. Um, and then alternatively is really trying to find opportunities for our buyers that are not on the market. Um, we've been working with a lot of wholesalers, honestly, across the whole country, um, and uh, trying to find opportunities for our clients to get something that's off market and not have to compete with other buyers, uh, which is a, a, a really, really big deal as well. Um, and then one last thing, you know, not that I want to talk about this and Lacey's probably going to shake her head, but there are a lot of people out here that have a lot of cash uh, that do waive their mortgage contingencies. And I'm not suggesting to do that. Um, but what I am suggesting to do uh, is do whatever you can to try to get a property under contract today. Because what happens is a year from today, just like last year, the market might appreciate by 10%. Okay. So if you pay five or ten thousand dollars over appraised value today but your property is worth seventy five thousand dollars in the future who cares about the five or ten thousand dollars right now i'm not going to say it's going to appreciate again by another ten percent or whatever it appreciated at but guess what history repeats itself here and even pre-covid we saw mega appreciation you may not see quite as much but buying today will yield you better results in the future don't worry about the upfront money right now i i'd say the back end money is going to be more um, when you're closing on a property. So that's my opinion. Yeah. I love all those tips because I feel like that that's what I'm seeing. Um, and <clears throat> the, like literally like you talked, touched upon like the minute details of like what a seller has to go through. They could have 20 offers and it's literally a matter of like every five or six of them could be the exact same terms, but one pre-approval has Lacey's name and one has that, you know, random person from another state you know, on an internet mortgage company, Lacey's is probably going to get accepted. Um, it's more just, than likely. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's just one of those things because someone can actually call her. She picks up the phone all the time. She uh, probably has already spoken to the list agent. Like I was going to say that they don't even have a chance to call me because yeah. I already called them. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it makes a huge difference. It is. And it, it's amazing once you get into this, like there may be people watching right now that may, may be home buyers or home sellers in the area. And uh, it's, it's really amazing once you get into the thick of it, of how complicated it is because of the small details. Uh, yeah. And when you're writing an offer in a highly competitive market, those small details matter so much. Because if, like you said, if you have 10 offers and they're all identical, the only difference is who is the agent, who is the lender? OK, right. guess what? They're going to the, the not only the seller, but the listing agent is going to want to work with somebody that they know or they're more comfortable with. Um, and again, that's not the only component to this. And there are other, are other things you could do to get it accepted. But uh, clear line of communication and working with professionals is the first step. One hundred percent. And to that point, too, um, especially now, since there is so much you know, competition, depending on the area that you're looking at, the type of home. Um, you know, having a collaboration between all of us is huge. Having the, the, so typically the attorney, as you know, like gets involved after the offer's accepted, all of that, you know, back and forth has already been done. Um, but nowadays I feel like I'm getting involved way earlier, which I love because I can support my agents 
to say, hey, I want to, you know, offer usually occupancy, meaning that, you know, the seller would be able to stay past closing. Maybe that's the, the little nugget that the list agent said will get your offer accepted or potentially give you a better chance. And help helping that agent formulate that language to make sure it's, you know, kind of ironclad is is all about the collaboration um, amongst all of us really in the transaction. Hundred percent. It makes for a smoother process. And yeah. uh, you know, when you have everybody in and, and you like you said, it's more of a team effort and everybody is connected uh to some degree, it just makes the entire process so much easier. Uh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. And just curious, because I know you touched upon like, you know, how home values, especially in and around greater Boston, just, you know, continue to rise. Um, what aspects besides, I know you touched upon school, what other sort of things have you seen are like what makes like a town or a city like hotter than another? Uh, public trend, there's two major components here yeah. in Eastern Massachusetts. Number one, is number one is school district. I mean, that's almost throughout, like I said, we, we sell throughout a lot of parts of, of, of uh, the country and school district is always a major, major component uh, to what home values are and how much appreciation there is because of, you know, they get scooped off the market. There's lower inventory, right? Uh, but the other major component here in Eastern Massachusetts is public transportation, okay? And the closer you are to the proximity of public transportation, the higher the price of your single family home, your condo, or your multifamily home is going to be. And on top of that, the more amounts of appreciation it receives uh, statistically is going to be higher than something that's two miles away from public transportation. And the reason that's true is because a lot of people, as you know, that are commuting into the city, they don't have a car. They don't have a car, they don't have car insurance, they take the, the commuter rail or the T right into the city and right back up to where they live. So buying a condo uh, or a single family home or whatever you're looking for closer to public transportation is going to be substantially more expensive uh, than buying further away from public transportation. And then obviously there's other things. Those are, I would say, the two major components. Maybe the third on the back end is, uh, you know, things to do, walkability. Like if you, if you live close to like Assembly Row or a really nice hub where you could go walk and get a coffee, go get dinner, um, whatever it may be, that's also going to alter the prices because location is a big deal. And one thing I want people to understand here, especially if they're from out of town, is that even though like, let's even within Boston, let's say outside of Boston, there's like micro neighborhoods, right? In every single suburb, there's like micro neighborhoods that either have different school districts that you could send your children to, okay? Maybe not so much high school, but like maybe elementary school or middle school, which is also very important. Uh, and on top of that, those have different price points. So depending on those micro neighborhoods that you're buying in, they could yield different results. And if a realtor is pulling comparables outside of that neighborhood in another neighborhood, which in part, there, there could be times to do that. Uh, but if you want to get really detailed with, you know, again, writing an offer, figuring out how much properties are selling for in that specific micro neighborhood from a start, uh, start price to a finish price, you know, you really got to know your stuff. And, and and it's difficult, but um, uh, but yeah, that that that's that's pretty much it. And talking to, to that, the the likelihood is obviously that the, the those types of properties that are closer to these, uh, you know, the live work play kind of atmosphere neighborhoods, um, the likelihood is they're going to be more expensive. Um, so I do see a lot of first time home buyers maybe looking below their price range and thinking about like a construction loan or. Um, something so they can, you know, put their finishing touches on a home that maybe wasn't what they expected, but what they could afford to be in that specific property or area. Um, Lacey, can you talk a little bit about like how you've seen those kind of grow? I feel like they've just become more popular these days. They are much more popular. And actually a client of mine actually put in an offer this weekend on a home that needed a brand new kitchen. The kitchen was basically empty and a new roof. Um, here at Cross Country, we have an entire renovation or 203K team that handles those renovation products. I'm still the loan officer, but it's managed by a whole team. Um, they're very popular because you are able to, we're able to lend on the renovation portion of a home. We can even go down to the foundation of a property and build up if that's what they choose. But a lot of people are either looking further away in their price range 
or they are looking at properties that need a lot of work. And you can even tell just by a listing, it'll say cash offer or renovation loan only um, because it won't pass conforming financing. Um, but yeah, it is a great option, especially for the first timers who are just trying to get into a house. They can't really afford too, too much with the high interest rates. Um, and then they are able to do what they want to do with the house. And later on, you can either refinance out of that product because the rates are a tiny bit higher or they can sell it and make a nice profit off of it. And how I feel like, I mean, myself included, like I love watching, you know, real estate TV and you like fall in love with these like mega mansions and it's gorgeous. And then you're a first time home buyer with a certain budget and you're looking at the properties you can afford. And it's kind of like jarring mm -hmm. sometimes. So how do you handle expectations versus reality? Like Instagram versus reality, Mike, like how do you manage that for home buyers? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it really depends. I, and, and I just had somebody relocating, uh, from another part of the country and moving here and they have like an 8,000 square foot house and you know it's just like they have this crazy house yeah. and for the same and for the same price that they paid for that property you know mm -hmm. you're getting a semi-modern 25 or 3,000 square foot home in, Le in Lexington okay yeah. uh, and you know it, it's hard to digest I think for a lot of people so what I try to do is uh I mean, expectation wise, I think that people that live here kind of know the what's going on with the market. It's more centered towards people that are relocating here. And we do a lot of relocations. But, uh, you know, it's it's difficult. And I think what I like to normally do is piggyback on the things and the benefits of actually living in eastern Massachusetts and close to the water, being close to uh farms and the city and the Cape and going up to New Hampshire or go to Hampton Beach or go up to Maine and go up to Old Orchard Beach. Like yeah. there's a lot to do in a usually pretty small proximity to Boston. Yeah. Um, even if you don't want to travel to the Cape or travel up to New Hampshire or Maine, I mean, there is a ton of things to do uh, and not only for adults, but also for children. So I, th I talk a lot about quality of life and you know, I think one of the components to also buying a home is not only living in your home, right? But it, but when you're buying a home here, uh, people, I feel like, are doing more things outside versus other parts of the country. Like, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you what, if I saw one of my friends walking down Main Street in the town I grew up in, I would pull over and see if something was wrong. Uh, because people be, because people just don't walk anywhere or do, do much stuff, right? Um, and that's truth, right? But uh, yeah, there, there's just this component where, yes, you are spending more money up front, but I feel like the quality of life in terms of things to do, restaurants to go to, parks, places to go with your kids, beaches to go to, uh, there's just more things to do. So I really like to utilize that. And then we have the sports teams too, right? Like if you like sports, like there, there's just a lot of things going on and a lot of things to do. And not everything you have to pay for either, right? Like we go to the beaches every single weekend with our kids. And uh, that benefit is just, it's just major being so close to water. So, you know, again, you're not going to get an 8,000 square foot house in Lexington for a, a million dollars. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be five or $8 million, right? right. But uh, you got to manage expectations. I would say when it comes to the HGTV stuff, I really don't watch much of that myself, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, it, it's, this market is difficult. And it, it, it's very difficult for a lot of people out there. So setting your expectation early and looking at properties that are within or under your price range is yeah. the key. It's well, I think the key. managing expectations generally in every aspect, not just like what you're going shopping, but also just in terms of the process itself. I feel like that's always been the most, that, that's what I think helps give a client a really great experience when they have, they understand the timeline, they understand you know, everyone's role. They understand how sort of we all work together and all of that is um, key to like having a really great experience. The, you, the, the biggest thing that I could tell you on setting expectations beside like, you know, the quality of life stuff is when we work with, and Lacey knows that I do this, when we work with a lot of buyers, let's say hypothetically, they're looking at properties that are $700,000 in the suburbs, okay? One thing that I like to figure out 
is, and it, again, this is, I don't want to get too deep into this rabble, rabbit hole, but based on the bedrooms, based on the square footage of their home, sometimes I'll bracket like 20% above, 20% below, figure out the condition of the property or, or subject property that they want to potentially buy. And I'll send them comparables of, of their projected future home, right? And one thing that I tell them is don't focus necessarily too much on the sold price. Look at what it was listed for. OK, so if I'm sending homes to them that were listed at 700, but they're selling for 760. OK, now if they came to me and their pre-approval is good for 700, we can't start our search at seven hundred thousand dollars. It's an impossibility. Right. Then you go look at homes that are seven hundred thousand that are selling for 750 or 775 or eight hundred thousand dollars. And a six hundred thousand dollar home is much different than a seven hundred thousand dollar home. So setting those expectations in the beginning is a major major component because what happens is list price is not fair market value. And as you know, a lot of agents will list properties competitively so that they could pull in multiple uh, multiple sets of buyers depending on the price range of the property. And again, they're not you know listing at $100,000. We're not doing that, but it might be twenty or $25,000. Uh, that $700,000 property could very well be worth seven forty dollars or maybe seven twenty five dollars or seven thirty. dollars um, mm -hmm. But they were listing it at 700, so we could pull in the buyers that are looking for 650 to 700, and then 700 to 750. So that is a major, major component, and I see a lot of people get disgusted uh, when they see that happen. But when they know what the sold price is and what the list price was, at yeah. least they have a good feel for what is happening in the market. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's so important. It's actually it's. Hearing you talk about what you do for your clients is really a testament to you and like doing your job at a high level because, you know, we work with agents, Lacey too, like all mm -hmm. different agents and there are agents who just do not do these, these small details, which mean a lot to the overall experience of a home buyer, like being able to see in your face, like this is what you could potentially be buying. That is huge. I mean, and again, I think that talking to you know, um, either expires or people who are not necessarily listing their home and like finding homes for your buyers. These are all things that are just not typical. So um, bravo to you for like, you know, doing your job at a high level. Thank you. It's, it, you know, when it comes to that and a lot of the analysis, really what it boils down to is time. Yeah. Um, and time, as you know, it, it is valuable. It's a non-renewable asset. And if I'm saving time on the back end by doing that data and showing people what they need to do, even though it's taking my time now, yeah. it's going to save a whole heck of a lot of time in the future because my clients are going to be more educated or almost as educated as I am, depending on what the price point they're looking at, where they're looking, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Uh, that makes the process from, from start to getting across the finish line much easier. Yes, the back end work may be a little bit longer. And there's a lot of agents that either don't know how to do that or don't want to do that because it is time consuming in the beginning. But again, it saves you a ton of work on the front end when you start to show properties because then you get your offer accepted. You're looking in a price range you should be looking at. And uh, then the process from getting an offer accepted to closing is just 100 times smoother, in yeah. my opinion. And yeah. that's the way I do it. I mean, that's that's the way I've always done it. And it's it's similar to how, again, push for the pre-underwriting is important. You're Again, you're doing that homework beforehand. You're doing all the heavy lifting beforehand. So you're set up. Sure. Yep. And we don't mind that at all. We want yeah. to make sure that the process runs smoothly. Everybody's happy. Yeah. We all have the right. same end game. And right. Exactly Lacey does the same thing with the pre-underwrite because essentially somebody could get pre-underwritten. It doesn't mean they're going to buy a house, you know, in three months and six months or whatever. Right. And it takes her more work to do the pre-underwrite, right? Mm -hmm. She could very, uh, very well just pump out a pre-approval and just say, here you go. You know what I mean? Exactly. But by her doing that back end work and getting them pre-underwritten, if we could, you know, convey that to the buyer that they should get pre-underwritten, it's more work for the two of us. But again, it's going to save it's going to save us on the front end of of when we're looking at properties and writing offers. And that's really what it's about. Uh, it's setting them up for success. It's more work on the back end and mm -hmm. less work on the front end. Yeah, we create winners. Yeah. That's it. I love it. Well, so to kind of end and um, come to a full circle here, like maybe just a last um, last word, last tip that you would give a home buyer. Um, what do you think, Lacey? Don't get discouraged, stay motivated. If you need motivation, we are a great team. Um, 
because we just want to help you. We love happy people. And I think that's what I've been doing the last couple of years, just keeping my clients happy and motivated. Listen to your team. That's the, that's the next piece of advice. Listen to your team's advice. Listen to Mike's advice, Liz's advice, my advice, because that will set you up for success. What about you, Mike? She yeah. stole everything that I was going to say. So now I don't know what to do. <laughs> Um, so to get set up for success, <laughs> so, so to get set up for success, obviously it's, this is, and this is for the home buyer, right? So to get set up for success, obviously what you want to do is do your homework today, get mm -hmm. started today. If you're going to buy in the spring or the summer, don't start then because what's going to happen is you're going to have to learn all the stuff that we just talked about, or potentially some of the stuff we just talked about. And you're going to continuously get outbid because there's mm -hmm. going to be people that are multiple steps ahead of you because guess what? They did this last year and they got outbid. Then they came to terms with what they need to do and they're writing offers. So how are you going to compete as a buyer with somebody that's been in the market for the last two years? You're not going to be able to because they're going to be more educated. They're going to know what they need to do to write an offer. And so is their agent. Right. Even though they didn't get their offer accepted in the beginning, got to realize there's a lot of cash buyers out there. Maybe they don't have 50 percent to put down and that's why they're getting outbid. OK, mm -hmm. um, so do the work, do the homework now, research who to hire. OK, make sure you're working with high volume people that are doing this at a high level, know what they're doing and put your nose to the grindstone and just get it done today. Start the process today so you can win in the future. I love that. Yay. I'm, I don't even, I'm not going to give any more tips because that was it. That was, it. <laughs> well, I want, I want to thank you both for your time today. I think it was super helpful for all those home buyers out there. Um, and it was just fun to chat with y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.